Uh, it's a very s simple s subject. You will not hear a lot of new things. Just want to refresh yourself, bait yourself into uh, the love of God. You know, when you, if you study theology or you want to go deeper in studying the Word of God, you will come across, uh, normally if you go to Bible school, you will uh, start with the attributes of God. God is eternal. God is a spirit. And then you will, you will be moving on uh, over these things. So, and most of the attributes of God are classified in categories. And then you have uh, two kinds of, mainly, uh, of, of uh, categories. The absolute attributes of God, we can call them them, or the incommunicable uh, attributes of God. That means that these are independent uh, of a relationship with the creation. This is, God is like this. And it's not in relation to you. He's, he's eternal. It has nothing to do with you. Uh, he self-exists, uh, he doesn't change. So this is who God is. But there are other attributes that we call the relative attributes, or the communicable attributes, and these are in connection with his creation. These, these attributes relate to you. It's part of his nature to, uh, to, to touch your life. His love, his justice, his truthfulness or faithfulness, the omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence of God to touch lives and relate to you and bless your life and change you. In uh, the other slides, we will find uh, some scriptures that talks about some of them. The Lord is the only true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. This is, you know, a, a declaration. The only true God. He is the living God, the God, the provider of life, and the everlasting God is, is, is eternal. So in one sentence, you have many things said about God. In the next scriptures, you are full of compassion, of mercy, slow to get angry or long sufferings, filled with unfailing love or mercy and faithfulness. And if you look at the Hebrew dictionary of these things, you will, you will find how God is tenderly compassionate. He is the dispenser of grace and favor. He is not easily provoked, so that's good for, for us, huh? because when we, we mess up our life, he's not easily, and he can, he, he's very patient, and it, it, that's what we call long suffering. He doesn't get angry uh, very fast, and he is abundant in blessings, and uh, he is faithful and true. So today we want to look more specifically at the love of God. You know, do you want to be loved? Yes, of course, you want to be loved. And why? Why do you want to be loved? Why do you want to be loved? Because this is a crying need and within every human being. Go to any country, whether it is a child or an old person, there is the same. This, you will find that everybody, everywhere, and every generation wants to be loved. Is that true? Do you agree with that? So God, God made us in, in this way. There is a crying need to, to be loved. You know, you, you think this subject is going to be very simple. And you say, Pastor, you know, we know all of that. And in a way, yes, you know, you know most of it and all of that. But do you, do you know it? like every day? Do you, do you live it out? Do you, do you live by it? Do you depend upon it? Does it impact your life that you know that? You know, many of our minds and our understanding of these basic truths have become religious and traditional. We, we know that, we agree with that, but we just don't live it. We just do something else. So many books have been written Many people talk about love and about God love. We have t millions of love songs, you know. But then if you ask someone to define love, okay, if I ask you, think a moment. If I ask you, Stan, tell us what is love, what will you say? You will be struggling like everybody else to, to try to define the concept of love. You will not find words. Or you will see something, but then you, it's not enough. It doesn't see it all. It's not like complete. Is that true? Yeah. So we have books written on love. We have millions of love songs, but we cannot even express what love is. Is that? Yes, it is. It is. So, you know, the, the love humans have for one another, we say it's a love of convenience. This is how, because this is how we are, and this is who we are. It's like we have conditions. 
if you love me, if I'm happy with you, if I feel good about you, you know, like something like this. I, I love you or something like this. But the, the love of God, we know it's not like this. Uh, someone attended a wedding and they were uh, listening to the couples uh, pledging their vows. And they made their vows very lightly, like very modern and very like uh, superficial. And this uh, older Christian says, what if I would send them a gift, a wedding gift, that would match or reflect their commitment to their marriage? So what came to his mind is I should offer them paper plates because this is, these paper plates will last as long as their commitment to marriage. <laughs> because the, 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 their approach to marriage was very superficial, very, you know, and it, many marriage falls apart because of this false concept of love. The kind of love of convenience contrasts with God's love. The origin of love we find in 1 John chapter 4. It's a wonderful chapter. For love is from God, and God is love. You find many repeated things in this chapter. <clears throat> and you know, in a way of speaking, we can see that the attributes of God are an expression of His love. All of the attributes of God will, will, will follow uh, his, his, uh, his love. Because God is love, what does He do? Because God is love, He gives. Because God is love, He gives life. Because God is love, He reaches out. Because God is love, He is merciful. Because God is love, He is good to you. You know? So the love is the essence of God's nature. And there are many today who talk about the love of God who are total strangers about God's love. It's easy to talk about it, but to, we are still strangers to that. Uh, Mr. A.W. Pink said that ignorance of God's love leads to the low state of spirituality which is now so sadly evident everywhere among professing Christians. I repeat that. Ignorance of God's love leads to the low state of spirituality which is now so sadly evident among professing Christians. So that's why to talk about God's love and to reflect upon God's love and to seek to live and dwell in God's love is very essential for you, for your spiritual life and all of this. The better you know God's love and experience it, then you will become madly in love with Jesus Christ and it will affect uh, your, your life forever. When you read in the Old Testament, you will see that many times, uh, not like in the theological books, the Old Testament is not written like God is love and then something. God's ex uh, attributes are expressed in his story. They are expressed like uh, in historical accounts and these interactions for people. For instance, if you talk about uh, Sarah and the Lord was faithful, the Lord came back and she, she, gave, she was pregnant and she uh, gave birth to Isaac, okay? So what do we learn of God by this story? We learn God is faithful. So the attributes of God comes wrapped up in history, historical accounts, and interrelation uh, with people. In Psalm 136, we don't have it here just for the sake of time, at the end of every line, it talks about the loving kindness. We find loving kindness. We thank the Lord for loving kindness, which in certain uh, Bible version would be mercy or faithful love or unfaithful. unfaithful. It's repeated at, after each line of the Psalms. And the Psalms praise God for His loving kindness for two major acts of history for the creation of the world. We praise the Lord that He has the power to create the world for us and also for the deliverance of Israel. So each line of this psalm celebrates the love of God. The prophets of the Old Testament celebrates God's love as well, even when they were in captivity or in the darkest uh, time. In the New Testament, we find the love of God expressed in the coming of Jesus Christ and His person and then His uh, death on, on the cross. Amen. God is so, so wonderful. Think about the story of creation, okay? What do you learn by just reading Genesis chapter 1? 
There's a lot of things about that declares the attributes of God in chapter 1. It reveals many attributes of God. His purpose, His will, His intention. The, the world was empty, dark, void, you know, confused. And then, so you read the chapter 1, you find God exists. Okay, that's one attribute. God uh, exists before the world. Okay, so that makes it. God create this world, make sense of this world, the omnipotence of God. He has the power to give life. He takes this informed mass of dirt and blew his breath on it and he becomes a, a human being. So when God formed man from the ground, that's what he did. He just took some ground and then he bent over and he blew over it, the, the, the part where that in the form there was the mouth and it became a living, a living being. So what does that tell you of God? Of his intention? If you just look at that, there's already a big things that you will see. The interest of God and human being, the willingness to have a relationship, the, the, the ability but also the, the desire to create a world that is wonderful. If you want to have one proof of God's love, then don't look any further than creation. And just that one act of the power of God, you will find one of the greatest proof of His love. Amen? Amen? He created you. Wow, that's another proof of His love. I, I live. You know, uh, one of the philosophers says, I think, so I am. So I was created, so God loves me. If you are created, it's because God loves you. If He doesn't love you, you will not be created. Is that right? These are simple uh, statements, but these are the true. So many times we doubt about God's love. We're not uncertain. So what proofs do I have that God is love and that God loves me? Amen? God loves you? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and very like especially tell them and looking don't just do it fast laughing but just says God truly loves you amen because it is so true hallelujah amen are you glad God loves you how can we know for certain that God loves us he created a world for us and he takes care of our needs in this world. If you look in um, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, God created human beings in his own image. That's wow. Just this is another big statement. You are created in the image of God. Why? So that there can be a, a relationship, a compatibility, like uh, it is suitable for you to communicate your soul has the ability to feel and to, to express and to understand and to make decisions. But your heart, your spirit has been created as the part to communicate with God at His spirit. So that when we are dead in sin, our spirit is dead, we cannot. But this is there, it exists, and it is made for God. So that's why when we get saved, this is being born, reborn, and then we can communicate uh, with God. So this is wonderful. In uh, Genesis 1.30, I have given every green plant as food for the animals, for everything, everything that has life. Then God looked at over all he made and he saw that it was very good. So when you think about God's love, you cannot not think about his goodness. The goodness, God is good, is an attribute that is, is a, it's like a, a, an arm of, of, his, of his love, uh, like, like this. You cannot separate his love from his goodness. Gracious, you know, it's very, very wonderful. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 27, there's a, there's a, a, a verse that, that expresses a lot. It talks about the rich of this world. They should not put their trust, you know, and their money. But to us, Christian, we should, tr our trust should be in God, who, look at this, richly gives us all. Richly, that's a big word. Give us all we need. For what purpose? Why, why does God bless us? For our an, uh, enjoyment. Does God love you? 
Does he care for you? Does he care for your happiness? Does he care for to, to bring the best out of your life? It, it says it very clear over there. And there is, in this verse, uh, there is an emphasis on the generosity of God. He gives richly. He gives richly. Amen? In Psalm 106, verse 1, Praise the Lord, who give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. And it makes a statement here that is worth saying. Trusting is love makes a difference in how we face situations. Because we understand what it says. Okay, He richly gives to us. He created me. He created the world. He meets all of our needs. In Matthew chapter 6, don't worry about clothes, food, your heavenly Father knows. So everything points into the same direction because of His love. We need to learn to trust and depend on God. Why are we grumbling? Why are we complaining? Why are we envious? Why are we jealous? Why are we in competitions? Why are we so much living a life that is not reflecting the beauty of the Lord and His character in our lives? It's because we don't consciously, it's not because we, we don't want to do it, it's because we are uh, unaware of that. We are not consciously living and trusting the love of God. It would affect completely our worldview, our relationships, the situation we face, the challenges before us. There would be no discouragement. There will be the joy of the Lord. There will be a, a moving forward, a trusting in, in all of this. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Amen? Hallelujah. Daily, Adam and Eve walked with God until the devil came to them and deceived them. And then the desire for self and the distrust of God, the devil succeeded to convince them, God doesn't really love you. God doesn't really want you to be, you know, live for enjoyment. God, God is keeping something apart from you. He, he keeping you. He's not giving you everything, you know. Uh, don't, don't believe what he says, you know. This is what the devils did, did to them. To lead them to, be, to distrust and his unfailing love and his perfect love and then his, the nature of love. You know, so what happened? They rebel against God and they lost that relationship. There was a break in the relationship. How then can we know for certain that God loves us? Next, next step, look at the death of Jesus Christ. We know after the fall of man what came. You know, the God's intense love for our fallen nature is expressed in the plan of salvation. You look at the Bible, the story of redemption. It is a proof of God's love. Even after we distrust Him and we rejected His love and we went on our own, He still has a plan of salvation. One fact about the love of God, it is uninfluence. And this is something we need to understand. We need to be repeated. We kind of know it, but we need to be told it again. There is nothing you can do to prompt God to love you. And this is contrary to our religious uh, upbringing. If you have been raised in the Catholic Church, this is not working, you know? Because we need to do something. You need to earn something. You need to behave in a certain way. You need to uh, earn the acceptance of God. But the love of God is uninfluenced. It does not come in this way. It is free. It is spontaneous. And it is uncaused. You cannot do something to make him love you. You cannot do something more to make, you lo to, to make him love you more. It's, it's already in his nature. It is part of his glory. God is love. There's nothing you can do about it. The only reason why God loves comes out of his own nature and sovereign will. That's why he loves us. Deuteronomy 7 verse 7 and 8. It was not because you were more in number than any other people, the Lord sets his love on you and chose you. But it is because the Lord 
loves you. It's not because of how successful you are, how much money you are, how, how many activities you are. It's not about this. It's just because, just because the Lord loves you. Second Timothy 1.9 for God saved us and called us to a holy life. He did, not, he did this not because we deserved it. We don't deserve it, but it was because it was His plan. Isn't it wonderful? It was His plan already, not because you would earn it, but because He already decided in advance. Even before you existed, God's love was already on your side. And if you look at the, at the last statement, He did that to show us is grace. I, I was thinking about this little statement that looks so nothing, you know, at the end. Why did God, because it was His plan, He chose us and called us. Why did He do it? And it is not because I deserve it. It is to show us something. It is to help you to, to enable your mind to comprehend His love. To show you, he gives you something you don't deserve. You know, when if you deserve a punishment and you stand in fear as a child, and instead there would be a, a, a loving, let's say, grandmother that would come and says, "Don't worry, don't be afraid. You know, I love you. you you're my grandson, my granddaughter." And here, and then they would pour out to you like. A gift on top of that, like comfort you and show more of love. Then you would feel so, so overwhelmed by this act of love. So that's something like this. We don't deserve it, but when you start to think about it, that it is only out of the essence of God. He had a plan all along and he has done it to help us receive and understand what grace is. Uh, un undeserved favor to show his grace that's what God wants to do he just wants to show himself you know the love of God is also issued of his glory this is the glory of God this is his glorious nature when he loves he is glorified when you respond to his love he is glorified when you get saved he is glorified. When you get saved and live a life that honors Him, He is glorified. So everything is about His glory. It's about the glory of God. So when you respond and you understand that, it's all out of the gl glory of God. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. The love of God is un uninfluenced. The love of God is also eternal. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Before he made the world, God loves us. So his love goes way, way, way back, way back, way back. And he chose us with a purpose, to make us blameless. Because only when we will be made blameless, we will be able to live with him for eternity. We have been fallen by the devil's deception. So now he is redeeming us. He had, before the world, he had the plan and he adopts us. God decided in advance. And look at the last statement. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Think of God like someone good, someone that takes pleasure in saving you, and reaching out to you, and blessing your life. This is not a, a, a strange concept. It's, his, it's, it's him. It says it gave him great pleasure, or in other Bible version, you will read a more uh, conservative way, according to the pleasure of his will. His plan to love you, to choose you, was according to the pleasure or the purpose of his will. And this thought should bring peace to your heart. His love has no beginning. He always has it. This is his nature. It takes, he finds pleasure and loving you and expressing his love to you. I need an amen to that. Amen. Hallelujah. God decided in, in advance. There's an implication here. It means that God can love us without us deserving it. But there are people here in this room that would say, yeah, it's good to you talk about God's love. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, but me, I'm such a terrible person. I've done so many bad things in the past 
No one could love me, not even God. This is very strong in our society to think about it. Because some of us has a pretty messed up emotional past. Uh, not having received love and, and, you know, these kind of things. But God says, I take pleasure. This is my glory. This is my essence. This is what I do. I'm God. I love you. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be special. I just love you. That's it. Can you say that? God loves me? For no reason? God loves me for no reason of my side. He loves me because he is love. Amen? Amen. Say that again. God loves me. God loves me. And I feel good about it. And I, and I want to enjoy his love. You know, this is, this is important to, to all of us. It is very difficult to accept that truth. It's a simple truth. But actually, many of us are struggling with that because we've done something. You know, there's a faculty in each one of us that works against us. It's our memory. The memory of the bad things we've done. The guilt, the shame, the abuse. And if, if you have experienced humiliation in your life, rejection, abuse, or negligence of your parents, wow, this is very hard to accept that. Because how do you relate to a concept of love that you have never felt or experienced, but you have instead had the, the opposite of love? Rejections, pain, humiliations, and all of this. And your heart is broken. And your heart is messed up. And your, your will and your mind and your understanding is twisted and almost unable to grasp that truth. And, and we come to church and says, Jesus loves me. And we continue to move on in our lives with our old concepts and our old attitudes. And we get discouraged and we get hurt and we get jealous and we just go on. We, we are the church. We sing the songs. We go out. We get angry. We are disappointed. And we go on and we complain and we go on. Our, our heart is unable to grasp the simple subjects. That's why this is very important that we talk about it today. Amen? amen. Hallelujah. Uh, just on that side, they said amen. This side, they don't agree with me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, it's for you side also. <laughs> Hallelujah. And one of the problem also is that we interpret God's love as we human love or un interpret love. And this is, this is wrong because this is not like that. It's really not like that. So we have to grasp a new, and it takes a revelation, and in fact, to understand and appreciate God's love, really, it takes a revelation, a divine, a divine revelation. The fullest manifestation of God's love is in 1 John 4.10 and Romans 5.8. This is how you know love. Not that we loved him, but he loved us first. He initiate love. He is love. There's no possibility of loving him without him having loved us first or having understood that he has loved us. And Romans 5.8 is such a wonderful and important scripture. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. That is powerful. While we are still in our mess, while we are not even thinking about Him, while we have no intention to Him, He gave His life in advance because He is love. Because that's His nature. He had a plan already set and He just made it in motion. He just accomplished it and He came and He took all of this. God's love gives us a standard for love. This is the standard. This is the ultimate manifestation of love. The first standard of love we understand in the act of Jesus Christ dying for us when we were yet sinners is that true love is visible. True love as is backed up by action. It's not only like a concept, a feeling, or some words. There are some actions that declares, I am love. Some, he has done something that is visible. The attitudes and the action declares, I love you. Second thing is that, in this verse, love costs something. 
he died for us. He sent his son as a sacrifice to take away sin. A sacrifice. He suffered. He gave his life. He bled. He was beaten. He was crucified. He was put to death. He was put in a tomb and left to die there. Okay? So it, it costs something. For God to love you, it costs something. So for us, there's an example to us. It's a sacrificial love. Husband, love your wives. In which way? Uh, the women know these scriptures. But I didn't, I didn't hear any men except uh, Brother Stephen. He's the only one that can complete this sentence. As Christ loved his church and gave himself. All the others were the women speaking. Oh, that's not right. <laughs> but that proves one point. That proves the one point that we started with. Everybody needs to be loved. Yeah. All I need is love. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. True love is also beneficial. True love benefits someone. It brings benefits to other people. We were sinners. He died for us so that we are accepted. Remember when I talked the last time, I talked about uh, uh, we were dead in sins, but because of his great love, he gave us new life. That's the same, that's the same uh, concept. In 1 Corinthians 13, 5, it's not on the text here. It does not, it says, love does not demand its own way. So it's not about me. Love is not about me. But today, it's like infatuation. We have this electrified, high feeling of being, falling in love. And, but many times, it's for ourselves. I feel good. Somebody loves me, you know. I found a girlfriend, uh, you know, a boyfriend and all this. Makes you feel good. But here in this text, it's not a... You think Jesus felt good on the cross? No. no. When he was humiliated, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he did not feel good. He was shedding blood of, of, with, with uh, uh, tears with blood, okay. So it was not good, you know. It was bad. But he went there. But in Hebrew, we learned that because of the joy of seeing the result that what he was going to provide for us, he, if he could feel joy, not at facing the, the events to come, but at the end results in your life because he loves, you know? That's, that's true love. Look at the results and it, it, benefits, it benefits you. Or human tendencies about what's in it for me, what might benefit into this, you know, but his love is not for personal gain. You know, like I was thinking about a concept to illustrate that, okay. If you go to a hospital and the dead bed of someone is dying from cancer, okay, you will probably feel something close to what I'm describing here. Because there's, when, when you are experiencing this, this thing here, You don't feel for yourself. You see the end of that person. You see the misery, the pain, the suffering. And what you feel inside is like, what, what the Bible talks about it, bowels of compassion. So it's like a love that we seldom feel. Because most of the time our love is conditional. Right? We look for benefit. But when you feel a situation like that, it's such a deep, unique experience that it brings out of you an ability to feel something that you very seldom in your life will, will live. And then you wish just to stay there, just to be there, to comfort, just to speak kind words, to, to pray, you know, and, and everything. So that's the bowels of compassion. This week when I, Brigitte and, and I, we went to visit the Grandpa Chan, yeah, I, w I was very touched when I was there. Because first of all, uh, there was nobody with us, so Grandpa Chan was there, and he, he only speak Cantonese, and he's hard of hearing, and I, I don't speak Cantonese, so it was kind of a, a strange uh, conversations that we've had. And, but the man behind the bed here, 
has heard that I was the pastor because Grandpa Chan says, oh, pastor, you came to visit me. So she so says, oh, you are a pastor. And this man spoke some English, and he spoke Mandarin very well, but he was very, very messed up. He was very weak. And his mind was not all there in some ways because he was afraid. Hospital is a dangerous place, he would say. You don't know what they do to you. Ah, you know, this is, and he kept, and then I kept telling him, no, no, it's a good place. And, and then I was trying to talk with grandpa and paying attention to him because this is, he's the one that I came to visit. But this message, Moxie, Moxie, pastor, pastor. So he's always calling me to, 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 to himself. <laughs> But so sometimes says, okay, okay, wait, 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 wait. So, so wait oh, one minute. So because I, I came for him, not for that one. So, <laughs> and then I was taking the devotional book uh, journey that uh, that uh, we had, and Grandpa did it on his bed. So because I didn't know how to talk with Grandpa, so I couldn't speak. So I could at least I could read the Chinese character. So I was reading the the title of each devotion to Grandpa and all of this, and then he was telling me all sorts of things. But sometimes I I couldn't, but turn around and uh, take care of this man. And then um, later on his wife came and his wife was a Christian, but the man was not and he was, Moxie, Moxie, help me, you know, help me, Moxie, do you have a mobile phone? Uh, you want to make a call for me? <laughs> Moxie was always asking for something. So when his wife came, he says, uh, this is a Moxie, so a pastor, so so they asked me to pray to pray for him. So anyway, that was a very special time because, uh, you know, I came to him, I took his hand, and I says, you know, hospital, there's no bad people here. They are good people. They care for you. They do everything for good. Don't be afraid. Jesus is with you. So I prayed the salvation prayer with him. And his wife really wanted me to pray. So, but because we could speak in the Mandarin, it was easier for me. And I says, you know, Jesus takes a good care of you and he saves your soul and he will, you know, bring you back and all this. And it was a, a similar, uh, what I'm describing, a, a feeling, a special feeling that seldom uh, we feel with that. Amen?